I'll just start off by introducing Dr. Gary Nolan from Stanford, who couldn't join us in person today, uh, but he will be speaking to you by WebEx, and hopefully his si slides will demonstrate some of this really interesting exploratory stuff that he's doing these days. Thank you. Gary? Okay. Well, thank you very much again, everybody. I'll just get right to it. So uh, I think that everybody at the meeting here is uh, fully aware that there's considerable need in the sense of uh, analyzing cells or analyzing tissues to do things at multiple scales, right? Whether you're measuring the intracellular environment, uh, which creates the cells or the cellular context, or the tissue environment uh, of whatever genes you might be delivering or whatever immunotherapies you're attempting to introduce. Uh, understanding all of these levels of information, yes? It was. Do you see that? How many screens are you seeing? You just be able to see one screen. Okay. I know one second I'm I'm changing the resolution and maybe this will fix it. Okay. All right. Um, so we're interested in both where the cells are, what's in them, how they're interacting with each other, and especially this issue here, the uh, issues of intercellular organization. Now, I've been in the business of single cell biology for, well, since 1983. I was a graduate student in Len Herzenberg's lab way back when flow cytometry was uh, three parameters, and that was the height of the technical innovation. So interestingly, since then, uh, flow cytometry has really only regularly been able to get up to around, say, 15 to 20 parameters, and that's high art uh, for many laboratories. Uh, Beckton Dickinson, for instance, claims to have an X50, uh, but most people who've used the instrument so far can't get it past 25. Uh, so I got interested in how do we get more parameters out of the single cell analysis that we're doing. Right, because we want to be able to look at the full suite of the immune system cell infiltrate or the PBMC or what have you, all the different cell subsets. So we worked with uh, Scott Tanner at the University of Toronto that originally developed the CyTOF uh, to then turn it and apply it towards uh, multi-parameter immune analysis. So we, to do this, we switched away from fluorophores and brought a different way of measuring, and that was to use isotopes. So the way that we would start is we would take the cells, plus or minus perturbation, cytokines, or what have you, if we wanted to look at intracellular signaling activation. At a time point post that activation, we would cross-link the proteins, uh, the cells. Uh, and then that, at our leisure, allowed us to permeabilize the cell membrane and then stain with the antibodies. And the antibodies are different only insofar as what the tag is. And the tag is a metal isotope. Uh, in this case, it's mostly lanthanide at the bottom of the periodic table, and we capture the metal via a chelator. This chelator is then attached to a polycarbon backbone. And then four to six of these are added to each antibody. So think of this as simply replacing the fluorophore. And I just want you to remember this number here, 180, because it will become important a little bit later. 
So then to actually analyze the cells, they're nebulized into single cell drops. Those drops are passed through a 7,500 degree Kelvin uh, flame, basically the surface of the sun temperature. And every cell is atomized and ionized, everything in it. There's a mass filter here into which uh, well, the cells are the clouds of ions that once were the cells are passed into a mass spectrometer. There's a mass filter that throws away all of the lower weight. And then you focus on the measurement of the metal isotope masses. Right? So these are the masses. The instrument sweeps 80,000 cells per second. Uh, and then when you get a signal which uh, is concordant across multiple of these, you make some assumptions about that that must be a cell. You then digitize the information, and now you've got a 45-ish, in this case, dimensional uh, plot. That's, of course, where a lot of the trouble uh, begins, because now you have to think of how am I going to deal with 45-dimensional information. Every, every plot or every sample I look at, I can't be looking at all the 2D plots and try to figure out what this is. Uh, so we've then developed a number of algorithms which allow us to uh, interpret or uh, correlate the data, find the hidden meaning in the data, right? That uh, everything from, uh, and I won't go into all of these in any great detail, but everything that will allow us to automatically uh, call out what the signaling network structure is, let's say we used a bunch of antibodies against phosphoproteins uh, in primary cells. We don't have to run Western blots. We can basically run the Western blot at the single cell level and then use systems uh, based analysis to figure out what the signaling uh, network is. Algorithms that, in this case, wanderlust or phenograph or force directed, allowed us to automatically infer the most likely pseudo time for a mixture of cells. Right? So, for instance, in the bone marrow, you've got everything from an early B cell, well, you've got everything from the stem cell out to an early B cell and then a mature B cell. And this algorithm finds each of those cells and puts them in their most likely place. Uh, an algorithm that's important for uh, any kind of clinical studies, but for a lot of uh, biomedical studies is Citrus, which we can collect the information. You see these bubbles here. These bubbles represent clouds of cells in high dimensional space. It's, this is how we deal with the high dimensional space. We basically mostly ignore it, but we find the cluster of cells, the density regions in high D space draw a circle around them and represent them in 2D uh, with a uh, size of the bubble or the color will represent the level of expression of a certain marker. In this case, uh, what this does is it looks within each of those bubbles of data and says which of these bubbles of data, bubbles of cells, actually correlates to a clinical outcome. Right, so we've done a number of papers on that uh, and approaches uh, and scaffold I'll talk about in, in just a minute here. So, so to give you a sense of what the hidden order is in this kind of data, uh, we started with a immunotherapy that had been developed in Ed Engelman's lab where essentially what he was doing was he was using dendritic cell activators that would, uh, when introduced directly into a tumor, activate T cells, uh, we saw it at least in the periphery, um, and uh, then it would be able to reject the tumor not only at the site, but it would reject the tumor uh, across the body. Right, so that was a Nature paper a couple of years ago now. And so our interest then was trying to see, well, we've got suites of cells that are coming and going. Uh, and we believe, of course, that there's some sort of inherent and reproducible order in all of this. So can we find it? Right, so we started with the mice. Uh, we uh, gave them either uh, an ineffective therapy or an effective therapy. Uh, and then we collected from each of those mice, several from each cohort, as many immune system cells as we could get our hands on, including the tumor infiltrating cells. So tissue processing, we then do the 40 or so parameter uh, mass cytometry, and then analysis and modeling to figure out what was going on. And this paper came out in cell about uh, three months ago now. And um, I'm not going to go into detail on this is the scaffold representation. Essentially, it, it uh, does a force-directed graph of all of the cell populations represented by each of these bubbles, and things that are similar to each other are near each other in the force-directed graph, just like people have with gene expression modules. Right? But here, these represent cell types. 
Uh, and in red are the cell types which changed during rejection of the tumor, right? Uh, and uh, in, in, across all the different cell types in the body, right, that we measured. And the, all of these that are in red, as it turns out, uh, and these are CHI-67 expression changes, were in the periphery and had sustained immune proliferation. Basically, all of these gray things that you see here include cells from the tumor itself. So the fascinating aspect of this at the beginning was that there was immune proliferation during rejection in the periphery, but you did not see that in the tumor itself. So that was the first surprise. Uh, so the, the next issue or the next approach to say was, well, we've got all of this data. Are we throwing something away? And so the idea is that variation really is a feature. It's not a bug of the system. Because you could look at five different mice and say, okay, well, I have this value of T cells in this mouse, have a little bit less than the other, uh, and so on, and create reference ranges for all of those mouse cell subpopulations. Uh, or you could say, well, what happens if, if this is a system? The level of one cell type should change what's going on in others. So are there principal components, right? Are there equations which are going to allow us to predict one cell type, how it uh, correlates or predicts the level of another, right? Uh, and so what we did was we simply took Pearson correlations. We looked for is there an inverse relationship or is there a positive relationship? And this is not so different than what people do with gene expression arrays. If a whole bunch of genes turn off or on in concert, we think of them as a module, or we think of them as an anti-module, right? So we're just applying that same principle here to cell populations to say, we know there must be order, and we know that slight changes, variations, are going to cause the system to, re to revolve or evolve uh, around itself. So what we did was you take those correlations you make then a matrix of the number so that the color of the red or the relative positive or negative correlation of between, say, two different molecules, two different cell types is here, right? So eosinophils, TH17 uh, cells are predictive mostly, obviously, of themselves, but are predictive actually of many other cells in the, um, in the uh, um, mouse, both between and within organs, right? So if you go back here, the effective therapy, what we did is we do a hierarchical clustering, just like people do with gene expression, right? And we, we look for the correlation. So these are correlated modules of cells that are working with themselves or working with other cell populations. These are anti-correlated. In fact, there's very few places across all of the cell populations here that you can look at where you don't find that one cell population doesn't predict the level of others. Right, so this is a level of discovery that really hasn't been possible before in terms of looking at the coordinated responses across the whole immune system. Now, if we take the order of the cells here, and then we ask, are there, are there correlations in other samples, say the untreated or ineffective therapy, you find, in fact, that the order that we perceive here is not found in the ineffective therapy. So basically what it's saying is that something has changed from the untreated, the cell populations that are coming and going, they've reorganized themselves like little armies uh, into, a different, uh, into a different order. And that doesn't mean that in the untreated there is not order, right? We can take the same cell populations and do a different hierarchical, or allow them to hierarchically cluster. They find their inner order Right, uh, which so there's there's order at the beginning. You wouldn't uh, you wouldn't be surprised about that. But there's a reordering of those modules, right, uh, from beginning to end. And and perhaps that's not that's not uh, so surprising because we know, for instance, intracellularly, we have multiple proteins that are busy doing many different things under a particular instantiation of uh, say an environmental input. They reorder momentarily. They come together, do what they need to do, and then go off to do many other things, right? Uh, they're carrying out their various functions. We're just seeing this at another scale. It's kind of a fractal way of thinking uh, about it. So the first thing is we're going to need eventually a new language to understand these intercellular modules, how one of these modules tells us about cells that are talking to each other. Uh, and, oops, sorry. 
Uh, and also, you need to think of these as virtual neighborhoods. We'll get to this issue a little bit later. So the first author, Matt Spitzer, had a great idea to say, okay, well, we find all these modules. Which ones might be important? And so his idea was pretty straightforward. Uh, he ordered the modules, right, ordered each of those spots in that last uh, matrix according to the number of other spots that it might be correlated positively or negatively to. So this cell had positive or negative correlations to many other cells, cell types in the system, all the way down, right, uh, in this reverse uh, time order, down to a few cells that don't really talk to anybody else. And so for some of them then, that he had sufficient surface markers, uh, he was able then to go to the flow cytometer, sort those cells, put them into a, a naive mouse, challenge that mouse with the uh, tumor again, and show, in fact, that this cell population, the memory CD4 positive T cells, was, in fact, the cell type which was capable of preventing the tumor. This was the systemic immunity. Right, and so this is how the paper got into a uh, cell, was that we found two things. One, it was in the periphery, and two, it was a CD4 positive T cell that was carrying out the actions, not a CD8, as many people might have presumed. Now, interestingly, I think that this is a signature of things that are going on in many different kinds of rejection scenarios for uh, tumors, because we then went and looked in human uh, melanoma patients who had been treated with anti-CTLA-4 and GMCSF, a different immunotherapy, obviously, than what we were using in the mice. Uh, and we found, interestingly, that the same cell subset, the CD4-positive T cells, which were analogous to the cells uh, which we saw in the mouse, was, in fact, the cell population that correlated, the cell population that best correlated for an increase in responsiveness to the therapy itself. So I think we might have a, a, uh, a pan therapy signature for an effective immune response. I suspect that we're going to see this as well in other diseases such as, um, such as influenza or other uh, kinds of inflammatory events that involve a pro-action on the part of the immune system to get rid of uh, an invader. So yet to be determined, but I think that that's what's going to be the case. So here's something interesting, right? Here you have the suspension cells, which are, are running around the body like a whole bunch of ricocheting marbles. They're doing things. They know what each other are, are doing. Uh, so you can still find that order in the, uh, in the suspension cells themselves. Imagine what we could possibly do then if we could go into the tissue itself uh, and then look at that uh, kind of uh, relationship with the kind of parameterization that we can do with Cytop. So uh, I'm going to show you two techniques today that we've developed for doing this. So Sean Bendel had, had created the Cytop in my lab. He was the primary postdoc doing that. Mike Angelo was a clinical fellow. He was uh, chief resident in, at UCSF in pathology. And he saw Sean's paper and said, hey, maybe we could use a different kind of mass spectrometer to do exactly what Sean did with immune system cells, but in tissues. Because Mike knew what was wrong with the current state of pathology. You can't do regularly more than two to four uh, parameters. Of course, there's a few instruments out there, like the Vectra, able to do, let's say, up to eight. But nothing comes close to the 45 or so that we can now do with Cytoc. So his idea was to use something called secondary ion mass spectrometry. And we published this in Nature Medicine a few years ago uh, as a trial case, where basically what you do is you shoot a beam of ions at the tissue. Think of it as a sand blaster. It scrapes areas of the tissue. It completely obliterates those areas and turns them into their constituent ions. You then pass them through a mass filter, just like a time of flight, like we do with Cytop, and then you measure uh, the ions that were here. So he used some of the antibodies that Sean had made for the suspension cells in Cytop and basically redeployed them in a tissue context. And so what you see here is one of the first images that we created where we're measuring here, false color, of course, we're measuring here different isotopes. Now, this instrument costs four and a half million dollars and the original one we used, and we can only do seven. So Mike and Sean uh, got together and built a new one. 
Uh, they're both now assistant professors in the Department of Pathology at Stanford. Uh, and so this is my instrument that just showed up in the lab a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so it's, it's capable of going down, this, this is what got me all excited, 20 nanometers, uh, X, Y, 5 nanometers Z depth, right? Field of view can be as big as you, as you need it to be. We can do 55 isotopes now, and at super resolution, uh, we can do thousands of uh, uh, barcodes. And then we can do one to five, this is what's important, one to five antibodies. Sorry, I'm putting the, putting the dog out. One to five antibodies per pixel, right? So this is where the sensitivity issue comes in, right? The idea that we had 180 antibodies uh, on our 180 isotopes on our antibody. This instrument is essentially 5% ion efficient, meaning that if there's 100 ions there, we can see five of them. So we had 180 ions on the antibody, we pretty much see every one. Uh, and it is, uh, its dynamic range is incredible. So this is where the sample goes, that's the ion gun, this room for another ion gun over here that has different characteristics that this is now up and running in the lab. So the idea is clinical tissue biopsy, stain with the elemental isotopes, use this to scan, collect those ions, do the time of flight, count what the ions are for each of the channels, and then recolor the pixels. So here's the, uh, some of the reagents we've already validated for this uh, that work together in, in high-level panels. Um, and so there's just some uh, high-res images that we've done. So now we're doing not seven at a time that we did for the Nature of Medicine paper. Now we're doing 40 or so at a time, right? So, uh, and it's, it's uh, of course, quantitative. There's no problem with uh, immunofluorescence background for autofluorescence because there's no such thing as auto mass, right? You just don't get that. So we can tune this to see beautifully uh, all of the antibodies that are there, uh, right down to the single or near single molecule level, right? So in this case, here's just red is the mentin, green is SMA, blue is the double-stranded DNA, uh, and then using another set of markers, these are looking at infiltrating mast cells. You can see them quite nicely here, here, and here, right? At, again, very high sensitivity. Um, here's some work that Mike has been doing with Genentech using some PDL1 tumors. Uh, they're positive in the tumor itself. And here in this particular biopsy, this patient, the PDL1, is immune positive, right? So red here are the tumor cells and, that are expressing PDL1. Uh, and in this case, there are some rare immune system cells scattered around here. Uh, sorry, here they are that uh, the tumor is um, expressing, sorry, the immune system is expressing the uh, PDL1, right? But then we can look at all the other markers, CD3, CD8, CD4, uh, FOXP3, right? The transcription factor, important for Tregs, CD31, et cetera. And then we can ask simultaneously where some other transcription factors are, where are the B cells here, uh, and whether the cells are dividing or not. Right, so and on and on, so up to 35, 40 markers measurable. And then this information, of course, is now quantitatable, right? So the, the, the objective, of course, for such quantitation is to do that kind of analysis that I mentioned before, where we basically backtrack. First of all, we would quantify all the cell populations. We would then look at the clinical data and look to see whether or not just the presence or absence of certain cell types is going to correlate with the outcome. But also now, as you'll see, I'll show you towards the end of the presentation, we're going to be able to look at cell neighborhoods, right? How close one cell is to another and whether these cell neighborhoods in fact correlate, right? It might not have anything to do with the cells independently. It's going to be the cells and the context in which they're found, right? And you'll see uh, what I mean by that in just a moment. And we can also measure things like metabolic molecules as well. If you've got an antibody against it, we can basically get it. Um, and this, of course, is all usable on FFPE tissue. So that the sensitivity is what allows us to turn to the FFPE uh, tissues, which, of course, are probably one of the major archival <coughs> tissue bank material. Um, one of the things that, so that shows you what we can do with the MIBI on the tissue, but one of the things that I was intrigued by 
there's this notion that we can go down to the near the near molecular scale, right, to measure things in 20 nanometer uh, X Y Z volumes. So imagine, for instance, the superstructure of something like the DNA and all the epigenetics that's going on, right? The phosphorylation sites, the acetylation sites, the transcription factors that are binding there. Imagine that we could bind all the various antibodies to those, right? Tag each of these differently with different um, barcodes or isotopes. This would be, say, the volume within which we're able to localize the proteins present. And uh, if you can do this at 20 nanometer XYZ, then basically scan it all the way through where we're, where we're sweeping the, uh, the uh, tissue with the sandblaster ion beam. Right, we'll get an 8 billion voxel view of the cell. So we've begun to do this. So here's now just looking at the phosphorus uh, in the backbone of the DNA, where both red and green are DNA, or phosphorus. Right, but we've just basically thresholded it to say dense regions of chromatin, say euchromatin, <clears throat> are uh, green, and then just lower levels of open chromatin are, are red, right, or less dense regions are red. So you sweep through, and it's just like, say, a, a, an MRI, where we're sweeping through uh, all of that, and then we build up a three dimensional image of the uh, DNA, where we can actually now already. Uh, trace the chromatin superdomains, right? So all the kinds of epigenetics I think people are going to be interested in and will be able to look at this in the context of the whole cell, right, the whole nucleus and where those things are uh, in the nucleus. And even on the right here, this uh, spinning one is where we've used bromodeoxyuridine incorporation into the cells before we fix them, where the yellow spots that you see are actually the replication forks right, of the DNA. So to be able to look at this, you can imagine now overlaying all of the antibody information, et cetera, and then we'll be able to zoom in nicely uh, by um, in a much uh, higher resolution way. That same kind of math that's applied for deconvolution of microscopy, we're actually able to bring to this as well. So the images will go from blur to a little bit better here in terms of the resolution. But we, we think we're going to be able to get down to easily seeing things again in the 50 nanometer scale, 20 to 50 nanometer scale. And if we add on top of this Ed Boyden's expansion microscopy, which we've recently gotten working in the lab, we should be able to easily get down to the 10, 20 nanometer scale with that. Um, now, the problem is that that new instrument I showed you is, is uh, expensive, and there's only a few of them that we've made. There's three at Stanford now. Um, a couple of people on the East Coast have, have, uh, have acquired or are about to acquire one. Um, they're being built for them. Uh, but uh, we thought maybe we could do something like this for every fluorescence microscope, right? Is there a way to approach this? So Yuri Goltsev, Nikolai, and uh, Julia Kennedy Darling have come up with these approaches that are in a way that allows us to turn any fluorescence scope into a 50 parameter imager. Right, with basically a little microfluidics box and a couple of tricks. So you can put the tissue onto the stage here. This stage fits into most standard microscopes. Uh, these have three little uh, um, spigots where the, uh, where the chemistry comes in and out and allows us to view, uh, up, right now we've done as many as 70 parameters. So the idea essentially is this. You have multiple antibodies. I'm only showing four here. You stain the cells with all of them at once. This is not a strip stain of the antibody, right? This is stain all the antibodies at once, cross-link them, and reveal only two to five or so at a time, right? So what you do is you reveal two of them, image that, remove the fluorophores, and then image the next two, right? And the, the, bio, the chemistry can be done every 10 minutes. The time, really, that it takes is how long does your imaging uh, acquisition time take and what resolution do you want. So, for instance, with this, we were able to do human tonsils, 41 parameter, took 30 hours to image one centimeter squared, 400 nanometer resolution, basically a limit of light, but 12 Z stacks, right? So we don't always need to do 12 Z stacks. Uh, so you can imagine doing this in basically about three hours right, one centimeter squared with all of that depth 
Uh, up here, what we're, you can see are the markers that we're using. And you see, every set of three is a different view of the image, right? So um, we can go right down. Those pictures that you saw there are right down to the cellular level, right? So this, this grand view of the human tonsil, we can measure everything right down to the cellular level. And it's, a, it's in 41 parameters, which allows us to do some unique stuff, right? Now we have everything that we could do with Cytol, the idea of looking at the, the breadth of the immune system uh, by uh, all the markers to call out the cell types as they are, resident in a particular context of the tumor and or of the, of the tissue, and ask questions about who's, who is its neighbors. Here's just another view of it. Uh, that's the same tissue section but imaged uh, with different sets of fluorophores uh, at a time, right? And you can see that this germinal center of a, of a follicle, a human tonsillar follicle, uh, is some, some pretty interesting views there. This works in also needle biopsies. So for instance, looking at kidney acute cellular rejection, this is human now. There's five different patients who are undergoing rejection, right? We can go right down to the cellular level again and look at where all the CD4, CD8 cells are. We can do the same thing and look, for instance, at where CD106 and CD40, two different uh, um, dendritic cell markers, you can see these as well, and you can see that obviously they were, um, they were overlapping. But patients are different, right? So what, is, what are the differences? Why, is one, uh, why are one of these different from the other, and is the form of the rejection similar? Open questions, but now we have the tools to answer those questions and not just say, hey, T cells got more, right, or there's, there's fewer B cells, right? Now we can look at the tissue destruction, uh, where the tissue is being de uh, degraded, et cetera. So, that basically, though, begins to, you know, beg the question, what about the cell neighborhoods, cell context, who's near whom? Are there particular niches, right? So what we do is with those images that I showed you before, we start by determining where the cells are. We do a, um, a, sequest we do a computational sequestration of where each cell is, segmentation uh, of the cells. We collect the information that is in that, within that cell segmented region. So we've got the algorithms that do all of that, right? Uh, and then we have some of the algorithms then are able to look at the cell markers and decide what is that cell, right? You have a reality uh, um, list, or a reality matrix uh, against which the expression levels of the, of the protein, proteins on each of these cells is compared and you say, oh, this is an NK cell, this is a that. So you can see the color grade all the way down here. We're able to nicely do this in you know, 20 or 30 at a time. And what we do is we go back to the tissue itself and recolor it, right? The original information is still there. We're just making it visually easy to see, well, what's going on, right? So obviously, uh, we can see that B cells here, yellow, all the way around. These are the B cell zones, and then in here is another, you know, some of the vasculature, right? So that's a normal valve C. Here's a lupus mouse. And the first thing that you can see by eye is that there's a incredible change in the neighborhoods, right? The cellular uh, organization of the tissue. Some of the organization is still there, but then there are these invaders, right, which end up being um, the double positive T cells uh, that are, are uh, sorry, the B220 uh, double negative B cells, right? So if you go down here, you have a higher resolution, right? And so here's the B220 positive double negative T cells in red. Uh, and they, interestingly, are not scattered uniformly throughout the tissue. They're found only in particular regions. So here's uh, the view of valve C and uh, early and late disease, and you can already see these are three different spleens. You can already see the changes that are beginning to occur uh, as the disease progresses to basically a complete reorganization of the, of the tissue. So that's just the visual uh, take on it. So what we did then is we go in 
And we created very, we've actually got three or four different algorithms that do it in different ways to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves. Uh, and they pretty much come up with the same kinds of answers. You look at a cell, you ask who its neighbors are, you turn this, you, you say, okay, well, that's an example neighborhood. How many other times do I see this neighborhood? Right? Uh, and, uh, of course, cells can involve themselves with different neighborhoods. Uh, so we're not limiting ourselves by saying once we found a neighborhood, we take it out of the running. We can now look to see whether, you know, P cells here, uh, F, have their own neighborhoods. Um, and so you can then take that bubble concept, the notion that uh, cell types um, where we put in the bubbles and represent them in a 2D plot. Here we're taking the neighborhoods. So here what we're doing is we're taking the most representative neighborhoods uh, from a healthy BALB-C, throwing them on this plot, right? Uh, it's a self-organizing plot. And now we can ask, well, are there different neighborhoods in the lupus? And here you can see, in fact, that there are differences. In fact, there's three different neighborhoods that have changed uh, in the MRL in terms of they've appeared, right? So these are cell, cell contacts and neighborhoods that are not found in the bout C. So I, I, this is a measure of the disruption, right? It's a, it's a downstream consequence of it, but I would suspect that somewhere in here is the actual causal uh, event that's uh, helping to drive the continuation of the lupus, right? And then interestingly as well, there are health-specific neighborhoods that go away. So the, the, the open question is, now that we've seen these kinds of neighborhoods, do we need to stop these from going away to stop lupus, or do we need to stop the presence of some of these other neighborhoods uh, from ever forming? Um, and so one of the things that you can do is, and that we are doing, uh, is we can take the healthy BALB-C, we can do those kinds of correlation matrices I showed you at the beginning, and watch how they change, which ones come first and go last, right? And then that would then begin to generate hypotheses about what the outcome would be. So you could imagine with this kind of an approach taking pretty much any disease where you can have, get beginning and end, uh, you can get the tissue out itself, and then uh, automate the finding of the cellular neighborhoods uh, and then determine which ones come and go uh, within the, uh, in the context of the disease. So here's taking all of those neighborhoods that I showed you from the, from the healthy mouse, at least, and then letting the neighborhood by neighborhood, so which neighborhoods are where in which, which neighborhoods. So there's all zillion different neighborhoods we find in the spleen. But again, this concept of once you've got the information, you can say, well, where are the B cells? So we're coloring this by CD20. Right, so CD20 is found in lots of neighborhoods. Marginal zone macrophages are only found in some neighborhoods, but when they are found in this limited set of neighborhoods, they're always very close to the B cells, right? So the B cell neighborhoods are sitting over here. So you can actually begin to build up uh, in a map of where the neighborhoods are relative to each other and how often they're found there. So you basically get a view of a, a gestalt of what the tumor looks like, uh, not the tumor, or the tissue looks like, uh, and what, what neighborhoods are, are near which. And while I don't have the data here to show you this, the most interesting thing that's come out of this uh, that we found is that the B cell is not a B cell is not a B cell, right, in these tissues. The B cell and the expression level of even the common markers that we all think of as defining that cell are different depending on which neighborhood they're in. Right? It might only be a 10% difference, but they are reproducibly 10% lower in one neighborhood compared to another. Right? I mean, probably no big surprise, again, but nobody could see that before, right? Because we didn't have access to the kinds of uh, deep profiling we can do here. We only looked at it previously on a fax plot and saw a spread uh, in the histogram. Now the spread, we know we can assign to neighborhoods within the tissue uh, that we might be measuring. Um, and then we can go back, as I basically said before, and figure out what all of these different neighborhoods mean uh, in a, and uh, essentially double check uh, on prior knowledge and make sure 
uh, that we're, we're not seeing something we shouldn't see, but then also discover new things. And I can tell you, we've probably figured out uh, about another dozen, well, what like we need it, another dozen cell types uh, alone just based on the co-expression patterns, but then found all kinds of interesting um, uh, correlations, if you will, of the neighborhoods uh, and how some are uh, appearing or disappearing in various disease states. Okay, so what I hope I have gotten across to you is that obviously we know cells coordinate transiently for multifunctional goals, but I've shown you as well, hopefully, how those oops, can uh, how those uh, can be used to say which cells are working with whom in concert to to uh, carry out a goal. Um, it can be carried out with a simple correlation analysis and some smart network algorithms, but just the correlation analysis and hierarchical clustering finds this. So even if you only had 15 dimensional facts data, you could still do this kind of stuff. So I would say go back and mine your prior data. These correlations can be found, right? And then neighborhoods, as I've hopefully shown, are another level of organization that uh, are yet to be understood. Uh, so, uh, and then hopefully used uh, that positional information to help work out uh, how immunotherapies or various, uh, say, gene therapies are operating. I've mentioned most of the people in the lab who did the work, so I won't, I won't dwell on this again, and I'd like to thank our funders. Thank you very much uh, for your patience, and I'll uh, stop there. Thank you, Gary. Um, we, we, because we did get, got a late start, I'm just going to open it to just one question because okay. each of our right. speakers is going to have to limit it to one or two questions. Okay. Yeah. Very, very, oh, I can hear him. Okay, very interesting talk. Um, so uh, I was wondering if, um, because they have so many dimensions, the analysis, I was wondering what type of uh, uh, statistics are used to make significant clusters, or let's say to filter out the background. Can someone repeat the, can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, so, that, so uh, there, is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of dimensionality on, on this type okay. of analysis. Yeah. So actually, he, we're communicating through my cell phone, which is in the back, so he can't probably hear through this. So um, the question is, well, I guess I have to go back to the phone there, right? Sorry. Oh, this is high tech mode. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, it's kind of invisible. If, if you go back to okay. the speaker thing, you Sorry. go right into the phone. And Right, so, okay, I understand. So, first of all, um, for finding the clusters in high dimensional space, uh, that's just a density uh, algorithm that basically says these cells are near each other. And that's, those kinds of clustering algorithms are pretty well established in a variety of fields, not just uh, these, not just us. We didn't invent a lot of these clustering algorithms. They're standard mathematical tools. I think the, the, the other question, though, that you, let's say, ask is, is these correlations. How do we overcome the Bonferroni correction problem? Um, and of course, that's always there, multiple hypothesis testing. And I think the main answer to that is we're actually, because we're doing module correlation across dozens of these things, uh, each of, you know, the, the finding of a dozen correlations simultaneously helps us uh, basically brush away the Bonferroni correction problem for any one of those individual correlations. Because we find the modules across dozens of cell types we're using, uh, and it's, as I said, it's, it's reproducible from experiment to experiment. Okay, thank I you. I hope very that much. helps. And, I, and I'm sorry that uh, so many things went wrong with the, uh, the projection, et cetera, at the beginning. Anyway, thank, thank you very much, Gary, and uh, 
appreciate that. And we're going to move on to the next speaker. And we, we were Thank reserving you. Right. we were okay. reserving five minutes for each for question and answer, but we're going to cut that in half. So uh, I'd like to welcome the next speaker, um, with Dr. Rong Thang from Yale. Will be uh, kind of extending this complex analyte analysis here, and he's going to speak on uh, single cell 42 plex cytokine analysis to monitor immune therapies. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Cindy, and also the session chairs for giving me this opportunity to present. So, uh, so my talk, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on very specific technology to look at uh, something I think that's complementary to what Gary just uh, talked about. And uh, that is the function of the uh, uh, protein secretion from single cells, actually, uh, that tells you an activity and, and, and uh, activation states, which can uh, uh, not be readily captured using uh, the imaging or um, um, the, the uh, sort of the cytometry technology. Uh, so I will. It doesn't really work, this clicker. Can you advance the slide for me, thanks. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of history about uh, uh, the technology development, why I thought I need to take, develop this technology when I was a postdoc at Caltech uh, back in 2008. I read this article. It's a, it's a, it's a nice article that, uh, that really um, kind of teach me a lot, but, uh, but it's not good. So, so if that's a sad story, it was very promising clinical trial conducted by Merck. Uh, that's HIV T cell vaccine trial, but completely fell, and, uh, and uh, the experts got together to discuss why. So next, please. Um, next to two, click, please. It's a work. Okay, thanks. It's working now. Uh, so, but, and one of the uh, sort of issues I think identified by experts in that meeting is, oh, I find this interesting. So we prob they said we probably don't have the right right tools and the best tool to really characterize the activation of the T cells that can really give you uh, give the patients the protection and then the, the tools they use, which turns out still in the gold standard nowadays in industry, is the single parameter LS bar. Uh, to detect the interferon gamma production from single T cells, but biologists back to that time already realized actually a, a lot more uh, cytokines are co-produced by the same cell, and actually Mario Rader at the NCI, at the NIH uh, Vaccine Research Center, uh, he wrote a uh, nature uh, review article and said, hey, actually, very likely in the highly uh, pro polyfunctional cells, which means they are co-producing many cytokines, really quality T cells that corresponds to uh, the, the clinical outcome protection durability uh, of, uh, of the vaccine-induced T cell activation. But if you don't have the tool to look at so many cytokines per cell, you really cannot uh, so evaluate uh, and the response properly. So I think, oh, let's just uh, go ahead and design the tool that was, I was pretty naive that time. I, I didn't realize actually engineering pretty difficult. Um, and uh, this is a device I designed back to 2009, 2010. It's a beautiful device. I still like it. And, uh, um, but uh, when I talked to Mario, and, uh, and uh, Mario said, it's a nice device. Maybe we can have a, a discussion somewhere you know, kind of you're isolated in the hotel and nowhere else you can go, and then we can have a serious conversation. That's a conference he invited me over, and uh, Gary was there, and then uh, and also Scott Tanner. So we were discussing, we we're kind of speaking back to back in that uh, uh, in uh, that that conference, and uh, and uh, Scott talked about that site off basically, and uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure at that conference Gary got so excited about it, he believes. This is truly transformative, and uh, by my technology, uh, when I was still like the rookie of the year, I believe, okay, just got arrived at Yale, 
And, uh, and I tried to sell the technology to Dirk Bush and, uh, in German, it's eminent immunologist, and, uh, and his response was like that, and uh, it's not a surprise, I think. <laughs> uh, so I re realized, actually, although I like the device, it's beautiful with a lot of spaghetti stuff over there, uh, but when I hand it over to clinical uh, uh, collaborators, they just uh, got a big headache. And I said, oh, it's really, how to make a big impact is really engineering problem. So I, since I'm uh, engineering now, so I, I should I should face this challenge and try to address it. And uh, over the past uh, five seven, uh, to six years, we seriously engineered the whole device and uh, and validating the, the new technology now. Uh, so basically, I uh, I, uh, I already kind of coached uh, several different research laboratories at Yale so they can adopt the technology. Uh, and and uh, also we demonstrate the applicability of the technology in many different uh, um, uh, uh, biological race race stories uh, shown in those publications. So I don't want to tell you further. Uh, so how many different generations we have? Instead, just to show you uh, what what we have now, this technology. So if you look at the schematic on the upper left corner, uh, so the, the device now is comprised of just uh, two simple pieces, no microfluidics anymore, and the, the, the glass slide sitting on top contains very high density antibody barcode microarray, which we created very unique, and each spot is about 20 micron or even smaller, and the and the uh, down there, that's a PDMS microchamber array, so uh, we can just uh, drop cast in the single cells into uh, the microarray, into the microchamber array, such that each chamber we have zero, one, or two, but we can image find out which chamber has single cells. So now it's uh, incubated a little bit, and the protein secreted by, this, by individual cells, captured by an antibody microarray, and then we introduce detection, and by microarray we can read out uh, all protein secreted per cell, and the single cell level. And so now we further combine uh, the spots and the colors, basically spatial versus uh, the, uh, temporal, uh, spatial versus spectral multiplexing. Now we demonstrate we can do 15 times three, about 45 multiplex uh, protein secretion analysis in the single cell level. And also each device, uh, just uh, uh, in case you are curious about what the device actually look like. So uh, the um, micrograph in the middle is showing basically in the cells trapped in the individual microchambers. And the, uh, after you read down the protein secretion, uh, scan the fluorescent image showing on the upper right corner, uh, you just overlay, you can find out uh, which chamber has cell and what protein uh, profile you get from that particular cell by reading out the fluorescent spot along the channel for all three different colors. So now the technology we have, we have more than uh, 16,000 microchambers and um, and, and, and also just even by uh, Poisson distribution, you, you don't really trap individual cells in each chamber. We can get thousands of single cell data points, but actually we can do better. We routinely can get uh, 5,000 single cell data points. Um, so now go back to the question is how to further scale up, how to, how to give, give it to more people's hands. I'm an engineer, I want to really uh, uh, kind of deliver the, the, the system to real biological uh, research. Um, and uh, it turns out the best way to do is really to get the commercializing, commercialization process started. And there's a company, uh, Sean McKay, sitting down there, and, uh, and me co founded about two and a half years ago. And now we are getting very close to delivering the first beta test instrument as well as the cartridge in the device that combines everything I just talked about in the, in the two slides ago. And so what I really want to emphasize in the whole story I'm going to talk about today is the protein secretion and the immune activation states, but actually the technology is very versatile. It can be tricky a little bit to do many different other measurements uh, I'm showing you here. So uh, we can also license the cell in individual microchambers to look at intracellular phosphoprotein uh, protein secretion, uh, intracellular phosphoprotein omics. Also we can look at the RNA products. We can look at the micro and, uh, and, uh, and also messenger RNA. Uh, in these microchambers, and also metabolites. It's another interesting collaboration we recently had with a Professor at Arizona State, but also my former post advisor uh, is seriously looking into this application as well. What is 
very unique in the, our system compared to the you know, flow cytometry or cytophys, and the cells are still alive. Actually, you can retrieve the cells and to look at the entire transcriptome, or you can look at cells that interact in the live cell uh, content. So, the, for example, the CAR T cell killing tumor, and you can really find out whether or not that killing event is associated with the protein omic signature. You identify that probably can predict the response. Uh, Okay, back to the story. So I mentioned, so Mario really believes the polyfunctional cells are good cells, and the, if you can detect those, you have better chance to predict the therapeutic outcome. So uh, we try to validate our technology first using the well-characterized system, uh, which is simple. So macrophage activation by LPS, by product receptor ligands. We choose this because it's well characterized, and also microphage cells are uh, post-mitotic, even don't have the cell cycle uh, issue at all. Uh, so the heat map on the upper uh, right corner uh, showing you the, uh, the protein secretion profile before and after LPS stimulation, so do see some significant elevation or increase of the secretion frequency because this is, this is single cell level. So each row across the heme map is single cell. Each column is a particular protein of interest. So we try to see how reliable this assay is. We perform uh, the same single cell twice, but this is biological replicates because the cells are still alive. We really did that twice. And we found the consistency pretty good, but if you compare single cell average versus the population, the, con the consistency is not very good at all, but I have arguments that should not be very good. Uh, but I cannot go into the details of the story. It's really because the paracrine signaling between cells collectively shape the overall response of the entire population. So that story, that's kind of a failure of the validation experiment turned out to be a cool story we published in uh, Science Signaling two years ago. And, about, and uh, we further looked into the structure of the activation states. We found, oh, actually, indeed, there is a very heterogeneous uh, states over there, even though the cells are phenotypically identical. And uh, the, the second row here, you see that big cluster, I just show you one cytokine to, into looking A, but actually many other cytokines co-produced from the cells in that. A particular cluster that's red in the polyfunctional cells, and then we try to correlate the frequency of the polyfunctional cell to the potency of uh, of the of the stimulation. We found indeed only that population gives you the best correlation that justifies the theory. Basically, uh, Mario proposed many years ago. Uh, but interestingly, we do see different states, right? So, and when we wrote the paper, we call that different subpopulations. But eventually, but eventually realized they're interchangeable dynamic states, but collectively when you have those states that give you uh, the most, um, so, so fast response, but also durable response. But some of the states can respond to the uh, activation very quickly, but some of those states slowly. And then the scenario in uh, infectious diseases, you do have the fast and also durable long-term response just through this collective uh, state's uh, architecture in, in, in this phenotypic identical cells. And, and then we try to apply the technology to look into the immunotherapy. And the first uh, study is not about the therapy, actually what the, the T cells function really look like in, in a tumor. We look at tumor infusion T cells in EGFR-driven lung cancer. Uh, it's a mouse model and a in, uh, project in collaboration with KT Polity at Yale. So we took in the T cells and CD4, CD8, actually some in A cells as well from, from the this, uh, this annual model and the before and after uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor treatment. And so we found a very interesting, this, I, I keep an analysis relatively simple. This is a secretion frequency uh, of uh, CD4 and CD8 uh, T cells uh, isolated from tumor. We found actually before a lotinib treatment, uh, you, you have a lot more T cells because the tumor is big. I think the frequency is probably lower, but you have a lot more T cells. When we look at their functional states upon activation, they are not very functional or they are not very active at all. But uh, uh, after a lot of the treatment, I think the T cells very much fewer uh, and a very um, and 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 uh, because the tumor shrink, but. But we found that they are pretty good quality T cells when you look at the spectral or the diversity of the cytokine production uh, from those tumor infusion T cells. Uh, so we have a lot more data to further kind of support this story, but just uh, I just give you kind of my take. I believe this is interesting and uh, that can 
in part explain why the BMS first clinical first line clinical trial failed because at least some of the patients I think their T cells are not ready it's really just like the cars kind of driving uphill, it's now ready to release the brake within the PD-1, and then you release the brake that time, and the car just go backwards, and uh, so you really need to make sure your tumor infection T cells are ready for uh, uh, immunotherapy, in this case, PD-1. And so, and then that, that's an animal model. What about the patients? So uh, a few patient data points I'm showing you here is from a trial at Yale and through the collaboration with Isoplexus. And so we look at the polyfunctionality. It's a little bit complicated uh, uh, matrix which, which combines the level of cytokine production and also the diversity, okay, or polyfunctionality of the cytokine production per cell. And, and uh, so from this study we found uh, uh, on a, uh, the, the patients without treatment in general, T cells are uh, relatively quiescent. Upon the treatment, which is PD-1, you do see T cell activation. That's not a big surprise. But when we compare responders, in that case, we know after uh, a, a while, we know we, uh, uh, who responded, who didn't. And we look at their tumor infection T cells, and we found indeed so the responders have tumor infection T cells that are highly functional and of highly polyfunctional, and rather than just the, the level of interferon gamma production per cell, and the rather the polyfunctionality on the diverse level of cytokine production can nicely correlate to uh, the therapeutic outcome, uh, uh, in this case, the immunotechnopone inhibitor therapy PD-1. So uh, when I present this data to my friend in Yale pathology, so, uh, uh, so Kurt, he said, oh, uh, in your data, you see a lot of grand B production and, and the porphyrin production and from quite a significant fraction of the T cells. But when I look at my pathology slides, for, uh, in, uh, I just don't see a lot of those T cell, T cell activation. I do see a lot of T cells there, uh, but the porphyrin producing cells and the grand B producing cells are much, much fewer than what you see. But I think, oh, okay, it's a different, uh, different message you get. So, uh, so what you are seeing from your pathology slides is, is, is sort of that, uh, what the T cells are doing in vivo in a physiological condition, but in our case, what we are telling you is the capability of the T cells, whether or not they are able to, <coughs> to kill tumor eventually. So, uh, so he said, oh, actually that is nice explanation. That probably is, is good explanation because if all the T cells are activated in, in tumor, you very likely have huge toxic response. You're going to kill the patient before you kill the tumor. And, but if you have good quality T cells, and the patient is going to respond sooner or later, just a matter of time. I think that, that makes perfect sense. Now I kind of also puzzle I had a, for, for a while that finally I, I believe that that makes sense. Uh, so, so now I kind of, from the story, I. Sh I, I mentioned earlier on, um, Mario belief in the, in the cells that are polyfunctional, really like the superheroes, and uh, the, 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 the really determine the response. But whether or not you do see those polyfunctional cells in DC, it turns out yes. And I uh, don't want to talk too much. Uh, but just a, a paper we published a, a year and a half ago, we show actually in hematopoietic disease, uh, and the, the cells are spontaneous, producing a lot of cytokines to drive the pathogenesis, and the cells are polyfunctional and actually very likely the key players there to, to drive the progression of the disease. And so we did the first experiment with Ross, uh, Ross Liver and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and it gave us uh, the, the unsorted bone marrow cells. I thought that would not work because everyone studying hematopoiesis knows uh, the hematopoietic hierarchy is so complex, right? So without shorting, so I think our taking our on like side off, you can look at tens of thousands of cells or even one million cells. We only have a few thousand cells. I thought that would not work, but turns out, no, we got a very interesting data. So in the panel on the left, that's the data Gary collected uh, from CITOF, and, uh, and we look at about <clears throat> 15 cytokines uh, and, uh, uh, produced from unsorted whole bone marrow cells. We found actually very similar clusters we saw. Uh, when you look at, for example, in the blue dots there uh, fr uh, uh, from the cells, actually isolated from a control bone marrow or healthy mouse model, and, or wild type, and uh, the ones uh, showing in red dots are 
the single cells pro from the MPN uh, the mutantamides. And so we found actually they are really all over the map that they do follow some structures uh, you expected, uh, but they are really all over the map and a functional level and a cytokine production level and especially see a lot of cells that do not really follow the lymphoid or the myeloid. They are co-producing both lymphoid and myeloid cytokines and the, they, they are uh, likely the drivers that messed up entire bone marrow microenvironment. Um, so in the last couple of minutes, I want to share with you sort of how we further take on this technology to look at uh, the clinical trials, kind of my, uh, my dream early on, seven years ago, can we, can we help in the clinical trial we don't fly blind anymore? Uh, so this, this is a study on the CAR T cells. I imagine there are two potential applications we can work with in the clinical trials and to, to really help uh, them better understand their trials, their, their potential predict their patient outcome. And then the first is, uh, uh, which is exactly the topic of this symposium, whether or not you can characterize the immunotherapy products uh, uh, as a QC process, for example, before you put it back to the patients. Uh, and then the second is, if you infuse the CAR T cells back to patients, whether or not you can constantly monitor what the T cells are doing or what the T cells are still capable of doing. And so uh, the movie I'm not able to show you, but the four different uh, uh, sort of individual CAR T and the target cell interaction experiments we, uh, we did, we found, oh, actually each CAR is very different when you look at how they kill the tumor, and uh, some of them really work along, work uh, uh, so hand in hand with the tumor cells for a long time be before the, the CAR cells. Uh, get 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 to kill the tumor, but some of them is almost instantaneously, and sometimes you require multiple car cells to kill one. Sometimes one car cell is super powerful; it can kill multiple tumors. So now, what I want to tell you is from this kind of simple observation of uh, the live cell car T killing tumors with action of car T cell very very heterogeneous, and uh, and, that, uh, and I think the pharma, including Novartis, tried to purify the, the T cells to make car T, but turns out that doesn't work as well as the, just a very heterogeneous population of the CAR T product. And then we designed this panel, actually isoplexes further put into, in, 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 into the collaboration. It's the largest uh, cytokine analysis panel at a single cell level for CAR T activation uh, evaluation. And, uh, and unlike traditional uh, field parameter or single parameter LS bar, you can look at only one particular function as shown here. We can look at 30 different cytokines. We group them into different functional, uh, functional groups. It could, could be anti-tumor effector function or stimulatory function or chemoattractive function or some adverse function you don't want to see, for example, in a pro-inflammatory or uh, the immunoregulatory that suppress uh, the activity of the CAR cells. But we can look at all of those at a single cell level to really uh, better characterize uh, the CAR T product. <clears throat> the data we collected a while ago with Novartis is showing uh, it's very, very heterogeneous, actually, indeed, uh, even though they have the best uh, manufacturing uh, process, uh, very good SOP, they can make sure the manufacturing process is highly consistent, uh, but the CAR T uh, products are very, very different uh, because the patients are different. So this is real patient specific uh, uh, therapeutics. Uh, so uh, again, what you are seeing is uh, uh, CD4, CDA, and also combined, uh, in the, in the, in the, um, so polyfunctionality or polyfunctional strength index plot uh, for different donors, different uh, CAR T products. Uh, so you see some of the very highly polyfunctional, also you can see different buckets, different functional uh, groups, uh, very different for different patients. But fortunately, I think the, the green bar dominates, which is anti-tumor response or anti-tumor effector function. That's good news, because that, that means, okay, those CAR T cells very likely can do their job you expect them to do. And, and then we further collaborate with KITE and uh, through also in the KITE isoplasis collaboration in the uh, non-Hawkins lymphoma uh, trial and um, this data actually KITE presented at ASCR a month ago. And so I just showed you the result and the outcomes, which is very exciting. And so uh, this trial, they recruited 22 patients and the 20 patients uh, were analyzed using our technology platform. Uh, so we tried to correlate 
very simple thing, okay, in the poorly functional strength index versus the objective outcome. Uh, when you look at the, the patient uh, uh, labels, patient codes there, and the responders versus non-responders, and the, the non-responders pretty much show very, very low polyfunctional strength index, except for just one outlier over there, which is very exciting. So this, uh, uh, so I would like to emphasize the pre-infusion, uh, so it's uh, so you can really correlate very nicely. So what they are capable of doing. Uh, in the pre-infusion stage to the, the, uh, the uh, clinical therapeutic outcome of those patients. Uh, so Kite already realized a while ago, so the best predictor of the therape objective therapeutic outcome is the CAR T-cell proliferation post-infusion in the first two weeks. And uh, we try to correlate these two things we found is so far the, the only thing you can correlate very well to the, the CAR T post-infusion uh, proliferation, and they try to combine these two together. So if in the first two weeks post-infusion proliferation and the polyfunctional strength index, you, you do get a very good p-value to predict the therapeutic outcome. Uh, so that is, uh, so I would like to sort of acknowledge the people in my lab who really contribute a lot to the technology from the early, very early stage of the engineering development and also an application to different, uh, different biological questions and also my collaborators I didn't mention uh, in the slides before and, uh, and also funding support. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm happy to take, okay, one question. <laughs> Thank you, and I also apologize for, uh, for messing up the air day. Thank you very much. So do we have any questions for Dr. Fan from the audience? Please yes, use please. the microphone. Introduce yourself as well. Very nice uh, presentation also. Uh, Fritz McBlain, Novartis. Uh, you mentioned proliferation. Do you know the cells are proliferating or because we know after transfusion Many cells locate to lymphoid organs, and are you measuring, is it a correlation with cell number or with, with proliferation? Um, they can redistribute after. Yeah, cancer. first of all, I have to say I, I don't know the details, that data from Kite. Uh, um, okay, maybe I, yeah, I really don't know the details there, uh, but I'm pretty sure the, uh, the uh, they normalize to the initial uh, cell, inf the total amount of cell infused to the patients, uh, or they follow the, the, the trajectory, uh, the proliferation rate over over time. And uh, yeah, but what I really emphasize, which is kind of related to what Gary talked about uh, uh, before, is uh, the environment does matter. But why in our case, we can look at a pre-infusion product activation uh, that gives you a nice correlation. Uh, I believe eventually we do want to follow the patients and uh, look at the tumor infusion T cells. But, but, but CAR cells, they're little monsters. They're not natural uh, native cells here we, we can find in our normal physiology, normal immuno, uh, immunology. Uh, so they really do what they are supposed to do very kind of a stubborn way. So if you can characterize them pre-infusion, you do have reasonable good prediction. Uh, something I didn't mention, uh, which kind of the superhero versus villain story, uh, those car cells could do something very bad, which happened just a couple of days ago to Kite and a few times to Juno. And uh, so we really hope we can also find out some clue from the pre-infusion uh, activation to predict the toxicity as well. So Dr. Yeah. Fan, can you stick around for a while? Maybe we can move on to the next speaker. Uh, ask